All right, our topic today is the lesson not easily learned. The lesson not easily learned. Uh, yeah, I'm beginning a four-part series called Reflections, A Journey of Love. An opportunity for me uh, to just reflect upon this uh, unique journey <laughs> and 42 years of it and, and what's uh, unfolded for me and uh, experiences and lessons and humbly to offer them to you for, for your benefit as well if, if they would apply uh, for you. Now I just uh, want to clarify some things that I will uh, very, from a month uh, from today will be my last Sunday here as senior minister and I'll step into another role Minister Emeritus and, um, and uh, I, I'm I just want to clarify some things that I've said before, but, you know, we can't communicate enough. Uh, I'm not sick, and I'm um, not sick and tired either. I'm, <laughs> I'm not being pushed out, and I'm not unhappy. This is a soul-guided, spiritually guided thing, uh, that a chapter is complete. And we have such excellent, excellent leadership on our ministerial team, most especially the new lead ministers, uh, Dr. Michelle Medrano and Reverend Joshua Reeves, which will take this uh, spiritual ministry to even greater heights. And I'm very pleased with them. And you will love them and all the work that they will do. And so I'll be hanging around here. I'll be consulting with the ministers from time to time if they desire. I'll be making appearances wherever I can look important. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll speak every once in a while, maybe a couple times a year. And I'll keep doing the meditation and prayer retreats ongoingly, three a year ongoingly, because that's a real passion for me. So Erica and I look forward to hanging out with you uh, because this is our church. This is our church. So with that said, I lean into the message. I am certain, I'm absolutely certain that we are all here as part of a larger journey and that we have all been advancing our ourselves, our essence, probably over several lifetimes, many lifetimes, in order to be prepared for an inclusive teaching, a mystical teaching like this one, and also to be prepared for the kinds of things we're encountering uh, in our world. I'm very clear about this in my life and in my journey. And uh, it all began for me, as I've written in my book and shared on occasion, when I was six years old laying on the grass in our front lawn. And, and I had a mystical experience where I was no more, but I was one with everything I was seeing, the clouds, the sun, the nature. Uh, it really shook me, uh, that, that sort of a immersion into the oneness experience. I didn't know how to understand it or integrate it. Uh, and so I just sort of put it aside. And then, uh, you know, certain events uh, continued to happen. Other events ensued in my young life. And some of those sort of ate away at my confidence and my self-esteem. Ah, but it was when I found Mile High Church and the science of mind and spirit. That's, that's where I got the insight and the tools that could help me strengthen my sense of self patch up, repair that sense of self, and enter into a deep, rich spiritual understanding that then gave me insights into that experience I'd had when I was six years old, as well as it activated that calling in me to enter onto this rich path in the ministry. And, and for all of that, I could not be more grateful. I could not be more grateful. And I couldn't be more grateful for Dr. Fred Vogt, Dr. Fred uh, preceded me as senior minister. He was the third senior minister of this church since our inception in 1958. Uh, I have been the fourth. And Dr. Fred was not just a mentor to me. He was like a father to me. Uh, he gave me so much. First of all, he encouraged me to believe. Fred encouraged me to believe in myself and he never stopped telling me that he believed in me. Never stopped telling me. And he, in specific, he challenged me in my spiritual development to believe that there would be a way for me to afford my studies at the University of Denver. And, and that stand in belief allowed me not only to get a scholarship during my time there, but to enter into my illustrious uh, career as a banjo player at uh, Shakey's <laughs> for six years. He believed, he believed in me. And Fred never stopped cultivating and mentoring me. I'd be there at college, and the phone would ring, and it'd be Fred. He said, Raj, why don't you come over this Sunday and do the readings or do the announcements? Uh, he was working me, you know. And, and I'd say, sure. And we'd have long, wonderful, wonderful talks. And most importantly, 
Fred encouraged me when I graduated from DU to enroll in our new school of ministry, the, our, our first seminary for this movement that he had been a part of forming. And then uh, after I got into the ministry, about three years in, Fred asked me to come back here and work with him as an associate minister, and I did that for 10 years. And I think about those years and the faith he had in me. He had such faith in me that he gave me free reign. He said, do stuff, develop stuff. So I did. I went to him one time and I said, Fred, I think we could do a symposium, a day-long event, and invite some of the best speakers in the world, the leading-edge thinkers and spiritual people in the world, and bring them together. And I bet people would attend. Well, by golly, we did eight of those, eight years, one a year. Uh, we'd have five or six illustrious speakers, and fill, we filled the Betcher Concert Hall a couple of times, and then the biggest ballrooms we could find, 2,000 people or more. We had people like Buckminster Fuller, Adela Reese, Art Linkletter, Rollo May, uh, Jerry Jampolsky, Leo Biscaglia, astronaut Edgar Mitchell, uh, uh, Norman Sheely, Robert Mueller, uh, Ira Progoff, and many, many, many more. It was so wonderful, and we pulled it off. Um, it rather surprised me, but it worked. And then I said, Fred, you know, let's also bring more speakers here to Mile High. And we created our, our rich major speaker program we've had for many, many years. Uh, and people in Denver looked to us to attend some of these um, events with these stellar people like uh, the people that I've been privileged to form friendships with. Deepak Chopra, he'll be back. Um, Marianne Williamson, uh, Mark Nepo, and, oh, and, and Neil Donald Walsh, but most especially Wayne Dyer. Uh, beloved Wayne Dyer, wrote the foreword for my book, and I, I just hold and cherish him in my memories. And um, I went to Fred and said, let's do a candlelight service. And he didn't think it would fly, but by golly, it happens to be all right. <laughs> we had almost 9,000 people this past Christmas attend those services for us. It was amazing. And he said, yay, keep going, keep forming groups and things like that. We did that. We did all that stuff. And then I went to him with a wild idea. I said, Fred, we're landlocked. We better buy some of this land around us. And he said, you know, you're right. And we, and we went ahead and bought eight more acres to double our acreage. And that's been a, what allowed us to grow. But more than anything, it's that legacy of what happens when someone believes in you. And I pray you have someone. But what I know is Mile High believes in you. And we here believe in you. And I invite you just to take that in. It's been said that the ministry ain't for sissies, being a minister. No way. <laughs> yes, at one level, at the surface level, it's about entering into serving. But at a deeper level, it is a relentless and rigorous journey in mental, spiritual, and emotional growth. This kind of work brings up everything in one that needs resolving or evolving. And I want to share a few reflections of key events uh, that, that have moved me forward in my life. May they, may they be of value to you. The first two involve a wonderful man, Dr. Ezra Ellis, and I've shared some of these. I want to refresh them with you. Uh, Dr. Ellis, uh, when, I, when I started my first church in Portland, Oregon, at the ripe old age of uh, 24, um, Ez and his wife had retired and they'd moved to Camas, Washington, which was right across the Columbia River from Portland. And so they would come to church quite a lot. And, and he was a seasoned Quaker minister who affiliated with our movement. He fell in love with our teaching and, and was very revered. He was a lovely man, sparkling eyes, gentle, deeply connected to God, really beautiful man. And he would inevitably come to service with his wife and we'd go out for brunch. And on one of those occasions, uh, we were walking back to the car and on this one, Winston, his wife, wasn't with us. But he said, Raj, how do you think things are going at the church? And I said, ah, oh, yes, I don't think they're growing fast enough. I, I, I don't know what I'm doing. I, I, I'm trying to do this, and it just seems like it's not growing. And I went on and on. And finally, as said to me, when I shut up for a moment, he said, Raj, you know, when you no longer need the church to grow, it'll probably start growing. And in my mind, I thought, what the? <laughs> I won't go on with that, but. I said, what minister doesn't want their church to grow? And I stewed over that comment. Uh, they're all the rest of the day and the next day, and then the light went on. Ez was connecting me to my neediness, my attachment for the church to grow. He was confronting me with how I wanted the church to grow, not so much just that our spiritual message get out there, but that it validate me as an insecure young minister, that the church would go and I could finally prove to myself that maybe I could do this. 
uh, because I was my biggest doubter at that time. And so he's putting me in touch with that. And so that shifted it. I started praying totally differently for that church. I prayed not that it grow in numbers. I prayed that it be on purpose, that it really be an avenue and an activity of light and joy and love. And, and then I prayed for me differently. I started praying knowing that I was called to do this, knowing that, that, that something could work through me, knowing that, uh, that I was who I needed to be. And you know what? I got that anchored in, and I'll be darned if that church didn't start growing. It started growing, and in fact, by the time I left it three years later, we started at 25 people. We were well over 200. We'd bought a, an old church building, 500 seats, had a pipe organ in it. We renovated it. In fact, I have a memory of myself on top of a 40-foot extension ladder, pale with fear, <laughs> as I'm trying to paint and patch this building, thinking they never taught me this in ministerial school. <laughs> never did. I got the lesson. And then another time, we'd gone out for brunch, and Winston, his wife, excused herself for a moment, and as um, said to me, you know, Roger, I got a lot out of your message today. I really enjoyed that talk. And I, <laughs> and I said, oh, yes, I don't know. I don't think, I didn't, it didn't really turn out like I thought it would. I didn't really feel like I was on, I feel like, you know. <laughs> and all of a sudden, Ez leaned over to me, and he said, who the hell cares what you think? <laughs> I tell you the truth, I almost fell off the chair. It was so uncharacteristic of that soul. And he paused for a moment, and then that gentleness and that light returned. And he said, Raj, you got to know, I, got, I'm, I was sincere. There was spiritual food in that for me. And you got to know that no matter what experience you think you're having, that's not what it's about. You pray about your messages, do your best, but when you get up there, just let it flow. Let, let God show up and, and trust that even if you don't feel anything, things are happening because it's about spirit and the activation of a truth bigger than you are. And I got it. I got it. God bless us. I want to reflect on two others before I get to the lesson. I will get to the lesson. <laughs> After three years there in Portland, uh, Dr. Fred called and said, I'd like you to be an associate minister with me. I've always wanted to work with you. And you know I love you, and I, and I know you love this church. And I said, all right, Fred, I'll do it. And I had to say goodbye to this wonderful, loving, beautiful group of people there in Portland. And often it is that our journey calls us to do heart-rending things. I'm having a replay of that of late. And uh, so I had come here to Denver, and I was only here for just a couple weeks. And the board president from Portland called me. And prior to Fred calling me back, uh, we had been working on our annual budget. And I had not taken a raise for uh, all the three years I'd been there. And um, they had, we worked the budget over every which way. And they finally said, we can only really see that there's maybe a raise of about $150 a month for you there. I said, well, all right, that's good. And I said, because, you know, I'd wanted us to grow. I mean, we had nothing. So we had bought this building. We needed everything. So I just let it happen. And so he called me two weeks after I got here, and, and he said, we found a replacement. I said, that's great. I know who you got, and I think he's a great guy. And he said, but I'm a little embarrassed. I want to tell you something so you don't hear it from somebody else. I said, what's that? He said, well, we're <clears throat> we agreed to pay him $1,500 a month more than you were making. <laughs> and I, first of all, that was my reaction right there, too. <laughs> but then I said, you know what, first of all, I'm glad because you guys have the capability of doing that. And maybe my leadership wasn't enough that I didn't call you to that. So I'm glad you stepped up to that. And I'm glad for his good. And I felt myself growing in that. And I told him not to lose another night's sleep over that. And one final experience. And so uh, I worked with Fred for 10 years here as an associate minister and learned a lot as I already shared. And then I felt called to leave. And so Erica and I and our sons, we moved to Los Angeles and I worked for a year at our headquarters. And at the end of that year, I got a call from a colleague of mine. I'd gone to ministerial school with her. We remained close friends, Dr. Peggy Bassett. And she said, Raj, I'm having some health problems. I know you know big church. Would you leave headquarters and come be an associate minister with me? I need your help now desperately. And I really wasn't too keen on the position I'd had, so I agreed and so we moved to Orange County and I was an associate minister there at the Huntington Beach Church, which had become massively big. And then after a year of that, Peggy came to me one day and she said, I can't do this anymore. I have to retire because of this health situation. And I want you to take over as senior minister. 
and I've talked with the board and they're in agreement. Will you do it? And I said, I'll do it. I'll do it to the best of my ability. I didn't know what I was getting into. Because, you know, you've got to understand the process of this. She was wildly popular there. And, and there was so much grieving that she was leaving and so much anger, too, that it was turning out this way. And I found myself standing in the fire in the middle of this. And, you know, the interesting thing about how groups and people can project on you. And I felt all this projection energy. I mean, here I was younger by far than she was. And uh, I wasn't a woman. I was a man. And for a whole swath of the congregation, that wasn't okay. And, <laughs> and this and that. And I felt all these energies and all these things going on. That year, that first year as senior minister there, was extraordinarily difficult but also good. Have you ever noticed how the difficult things in your life have been polishing you and honing you? It was good. Uh, th as we started into the second year, I began to notice that, by golly, that church was filling up again, too. They had a thousand-seat sanctuary, and it was starting to fill up again. And I was feeling good about it. I still had a board that was kind of manipulative, and uh, still had some people, every once in a while, these little angels come along saying, well, you're no Peggy Bassett, but I guess you're doing all right. You know, and, but, I, but most of the people could could get my commitment and my love, and they got it, and we were growing. And at the end of that, that year, uh, Fred called again, and he said, Raj, I'm ready to retire. I need help retiring. I want you to take over here as senior minister. And I, I prayed about that, and I felt my work was done there, and I came back, the best decision I've ever made, uh, now 26 years ago in 1993. So these experiences, you know, a, a different motivation for growth rather than neediness to you know support me and in insecurity at that young age um, a sense of um, that spirit has to do the speaking not so much worrying about my own experience that that sense of standing in the fire of things you don't expect or projection from people all very important to me so that brings me then to the lesson not easily learned and that lesson is that ultimately, it's not about me. Ultimately, it's not about me. That was a lesson. And for almost all of us, I would suggest that our greatest power and fulfillment wait for us to get over ourselves. Our greatest power and fulfillment wait for us to get over ourselves. And I'll say a little more about this, but it's in, there's an interesting paradox. And that, that paradox uh, is that we have to heal ourselves to be able to get over ourselves, you know? Uh, we have to heal unhealed wounds in our lives and develop a healthy selfhood before we can go beyond obsessing about ourselves. And that's where the science of mind and spirit comes in, with this incredible technology, this deep and rich spirituality, this universal spirituality of the ages. Oh, it shores up our sense of ourselves, and it anchors us in spiritual wholeness and genuine self-love. That's why I urge you to get into these classes and get this gift, this pearl of great, great prize. Oh, I tell you, it is such a wonderful thing. And I tell you, when it's no longer about you, then you find that your life can go beyond constantly trying to prove yourself or defend yourself or prove yourself with, with greater success or status or security. And you can realize that your calling is to show up as a higher activity of the divine. Not that that's little ego striving to be important or acceptable, but as a light shining brightly, a light of the divine, and you can listen to your guidance and make the deepest and the best decisions of your life when it's not about you. Hear this. This is very important. This teaching is not a me, me, me teaching. I have to have this or that to make me happy. People have to change. I need people to change to meet my needs. I need the world to be different in order for me to be happy or comfortable. Me, me, me. I mean, if that is the motive at the center of your life, you will sabotage yourself every time. You will know no fulfillment in your life. Your path, my path, is so much more than 
self-centeredness and self-preservation or self-promotion. So much more. Hmm. There's this bloated self-importance that's epidemic, it seems. Uh, it's quicksand. And it's an illusion. I'm reminded of the classical teaching story of the old, lumbering, huge elephant that came up to a, a bridge, a wooden bridge that spanned a ravine. And it stepped onto it, and the bridge creaked and wavered, and it kept walking step by step across this bridge as it was moving and shaking, and finally the elephant got to the other side. And about that time, a little flea came out from behind the ear of the elephant and declared, boy, did we shake that bridge. <laughs> well, that's the kind of elusive wisdom of the ego. Jesus understood it when he said, it is not me that does the works. It's the Father within. He doeth the works. we got to get that message. It's not us. It's the greater life within us. If it's freed from our littleness, freed from our neediness, when we really get it's not about me, then it can be about the larger life, expressing by means of us. Our founder said it so beautifully. These words of his are incredible. If you think you're so important, thrust your hand into a bucket of water and see if it leaves a hole. And he went on to say, we have gotten our little human selves so completely in the way that the kingdom of God which is given cannot be accepted. Are we willing to let go of this inflated ego of ours, this gigantic make-believe, this mask we wear, this camouflage, and in simplicity, accept life? Illumination will come as we more and more realize our unity with the whole and as we constantly endeavor to let the truth operate through us. Powerful words. Maybe you remember from your history classes of old, Copernicus in the 1500s, mathematician and astronomer, and he astounded the world by declaring that the sun, not the earth, the sun is the center of our solar system. And people scoffed and ridiculed him. Scoffed at him and ridiculed him. And then after him, Galileo took up that cause and that banner, and the king threw him in jail, and the church threw him out. But he kept saying that, and, and I think about that, and how it is that um, we so very often lead a me-centric life in a decidedly me-centric culture. Spiritual growth is like a Copernican revolution. It's like we realize that we are not the center of the universe, no one of us. But there's a divine light that's the center of the universe. And it can shine through us if we're not blocking it with our neediness, our self-importance, our pride. Then we can really shine, really, really shine. So I wanna offer you some practices, but here's the great truth. Here's the great truth. When it's no longer about you, the great you can show up. When it's no longer about you, the great you shows up. Three practices. Now, these aren't the kind of practices where you do one, and then you move on to the second. These are ones you'll always do, all three of them, all the time, all together. And in fact, it's a daily thing to do these things. It's the path of spirit and the path of power and love uh, to open us up in this life. And the first thing is affirm and accept yourself. Affirm and accept yourself. This is unlearning a lot of old negativities. It's affirming the higher truth about you. It's making peace with yourself. And again, that's what Beyond Limits, that's what our classes help us do so that we finally have a strong foundation upon which to build the life of our dreams. Affirm and accept yourself. And do that regularly. We're never ever done with that. And this is building up the self so that we can go beyond that. I love this uh, phrase, uh, this affirmation. We'll put it up on the screens, but it's easy to remember. I am who I am, and that's enough. Let's say that together. I am who I am, and that's enough. Again, I am who I am, and that's enough. Yeah, affirm and accept yourself so that you can then move to the next step, and that is devote and dare yourself. Rather than our lives being motivated about proving ourselves or besting others or all of those things, to devote ourselves to what really matters, what calls in our hearts, what drives us, 
what wants to be given through us is where it's really at. And then to bring ourselves to the edge and to dare ourselves, to leap into our greater possibilities. And I've done that over my career so many times. I've been shaking in my boots, but we've gone ahead and done it. And love will out. And so it's about devoting yourself to something greater than just managing and preserving and promoting yourself. And daring yourself to live in a bigger arena. But you've got to affirm and accept yourself. And then you can devote and dare yourself. And then the third step is to trust and transcend yourself. It's to make your peace with yourself, to trust yourself. And then to remember that you're an outlet for the greater life. It's not about you. It's not about me. You're an activity of the greater life expressing as you. You're a unique expression of the one life. But remember, enlightenment is when the wave realizes it's the ocean. So to trust and to transcend ourselves and to let God be God in and through us. As I was leaving to go up to Portland to launch this 42 years of ministry, Fred communicated with me, congratulated me, again told me he believed in me, and he said, Roger, I want you to just remember one thing. He said, Rog, just be. Just be. It took me many decades to figure out what he meant and how to do it. But to just be, it's not about you. It's just letting the being, letting your natural light shine in this life. So I offer you these reflections for whatever value. I know that they have a deep meaning to me. And I trust that they can assist you in opening up your life to the greater flow of the light and the wisdom and the spirit that you are. It is so, so beautiful. And these lessons, as I have learned them, shifted how I did the ministry. I, I began to have ministerial teams, not just me, teams. Collaboration became important to me. I talked about excellence and having a very expansive vision. But here's the deal. All along the way, it's not about me. It's never been about me. And it's not about me now as I make this shift. It's not about me. It's about us. And it's about this incredible teaching. And it's about love. And it's about God's seed of grace that continues to unfold as this remarkable community. Mile High Church is dynamic and awesome. And we must continue to support and bless and further the Mile High magic. And I get, get this, when you discover that it's not about you, then that magic shows up in your life as you. And so it is. Let's have a prayer together. And some deep breaths. We relax from walking the long road of being human settling into the deep silence of the being beyond ourself. And we remember, I and the Father, I and the Source are one. I am a happening within the Spirit. I am a divine idea unfolding from the infinite good of God. I am God being me. So I let the lesser concepts of me, the fears, the worries, the needs, fall away. And I embrace the great light of the Spirit. I open my heart. I return home to the love that I am. And I sense what it is to just be, not trying, not needing, not promoting, not scheming, shining. Imagine it, feel it, feel you shining. And not so much by your own effort, but sense yourself giving way to the light of the divine and letting it radiate as you.
on this beautiful encounter with God, with love. Always that which we are. I affirm and know that we go forth to be, to be guided, to shine, to bring light, caring, love, and the higher order of living to our lives and to this world. I know that each and every one of us here is involved in an evolutionary journey that is good and very good. And I know that every one of us is guided, guarded, protected and nurtured into our greater becoming. And I know that as we move all the lesser out of the way, that our spiritual magnificence is free to shine and to create. And that we also then gently and perfectly attract to ourselves all the right opportunities, situations, relationships, and opportunities for good. And I just give thanks for the deep centeredness that allows us to let God be God in, through, and as us. Oh, this is good and very good. I know total blessings upon each and every one of us. A new day, a new time. And all is well. And for this and more than words can say, oh God, I am grateful. So grateful. As you join me in that gratitude, let's declare, and so it is. And so I am. And so we are. Amen.